Hey, welcome back to the Oz Shift Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Anthony Trucks, and we have a great guest with us today. He, he's a guy that I got to know a couple years back about on his podcast, and, and today we have a really deep conversation. I've never heard this man's story and the way he shares it, and not only that, how he ties music into potential and success and a nine-figure business. And I mean, it's a long journey that's really powerful. So no matter what walk of life you're in, this guy is going to unpack some really cool things for your life. His name's Jeff Lerner. Uh, and he is the author of a few books. He is uh, a guy that's an Inc. 5000 business owner, Like, but he had a crazy cool journey that anyone can relate to. Uh, grew up in an interesting situation, had 12 failed businesses or so, Like, but he found a way to get to the next level of life and, and become a service to the world through his suffering. And uh, if you are a person that's like, man, I've been trying to fight past this internal clock to get moving or this kind of angst to get pushing, this story is going to be one that uncovers a whole lot and actually helps access that part part of your soul to get to the next tier. Uh, and as you know, I'm a real big proponent of making sure that in order to access those points, in order to do all those things, you got to have a great mind. In fact, I love the product called Magic Mind. So if you head to magicmind.co, you'll be able to actually get the code AWSHIFT and use that to get a discount on your first order of the product. But also at the same time, if you want to just go to magicmind.co forward slash shift, it'll take you right to it. And I say this because I use the product every single day. They actually have a new batch out, a new uh, kind of, you know, we'll call it formula for it, which is 4.0. That is a great. It's amazing. It tastes better than the first ones. Not that the, f the first ones didn't taste great. They were all good. But, man, the ability for me to be able to stay focused, stay dialed, have joy, have peace, be able to be present father and husband, it comes from me personally believing that it's my brain being fueled by the right stuff. And Magic Mind is one of the right things. It's the right stuff to put in. So go to magicmind.co forward slash shift or go to magicmind.co, use the code AWSHIFT, A-W-W, SHIFT at checkout. Outside of that, let's get into the show. Hey, hey, so let's get into it today. Uh, man, I, I got a guy that I've I've got a chance to slowly get to know over the last uh, couple of years. You got to know about this. I just told you about it. So let's pop in. Jeff, how you doing, man? I'm so, so well. Thank you, Anthony. I'm uh, right where I'm happy to be. I appreciate that. And you're a busy, busy, active guy, man. I, uh, I seriously, I sit back and I get to look at people in the world that I admire as humans, not just in terms of the success I've had business-wise. And you're one of those guys that I go, man, this guy's doing it right. Got them quads running around, driving things in the, in the, in the dirt. Why not, man? Live life. Uh, let's do this. I start the podcast with a random question, which is the same question, but for you might be random. You can answer it however you want to, but it somehow kicks off the convo in a good way. Here's the question. Okay. I'm walking around town. I sit down next to you, this cool guy with the cool slick back hair. We'll call it you. You don't know me, and you, for some reason, feel compelled to start talking to me. In your opinion, why should I listen to you? Uh, because I don't really have any desire to sell you anything other than what's possible for your life oh that's a good one that's a deep one right there look at that starting out with fire bro i see you uh so let's do that because i think there's a, a thing where people do realize what's possible for their life but i don't think that they really really get it right some people go oh, i could do x or y or z you ever heard that story of the person who they're in school and the kid goes, you know, ask the kids, what do you aspire to be? And all these kids say, Dr. Astronaut. And one kid goes, I want to be a pizza delivery man. And the, the teacher calls it the mom and goes, hey, do you do you know about that? Your son wants to be a pizza delivery man. He goes, oh, yeah. He looks up to his uncle in his life because his dad left and his dad, his uncle's a pizza delivery man. So what do you what do you frame for people when it comes to saying what's possible for life and them not being able to see past the first branch? Well, I think it's really initially it's about folk you know getting calibrated around what voice are you listening to okay. you know the the natural state of a human being is that from virtually you know you're we're born without a voice surrounded by people that have voices i mean we we have we can wail we can make sound but we don't we can't articulate words you know i've heard a saying that behavior is is the language of of children right it's, in other words we can behave before we can speak and that's how we express you know our our desires or whatnot but but all that to say like we don't we can't form our own ideas 
on day one, yep. but we're surround, we're immediately immersed in other people's ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that dynamic ever really changes for most people. True. We develop the ability to formulate our, our own ideas and our own vision for our life and our own agenda. But by then we're probably on somebody else's program. And, and it seems like if you look at most, even if you look at the very conception of society, you essentially hop from your parents' program to the school's program, to the university's program, to the employer's program, maybe to the spouse's program or the spouse's parents' program, to the whatever program. And, and there's sort of this concept of like, well, if you'll just hold on till you're 65 years old and you, check, you do all the things you're supposed to do, eventually we'll give you a few years at the end where you get to live your own program. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. And, and although as a sad math problem nowadays, most people don't even get that because they can't retire. Yeah, so. That's true. Yeah, financially they can. And and a lot of people, I think that they, uh, it's unfortunate, but after people retire, they actually pass away fairly quickly after because they're not giving back to the world. So how do people get off the, well, first off, how do you recognize the program? Because what you're talking about, I think people get so just, you're immersed in it so deep, you don't even notice it. It's like a fish doesn't notice it's in water. How does a person realize they're in like this kind of matrix-ish kind of program situation? Man, uh, you, you, you just got, it, what's crazy is it doesn't, I don't think it takes that long. I think that everybody could probably discover a completely different version of themselves mm -hmm. within probably 24 hours. Okay. I mean, and I'm, I'm making this up. I haven't, I haven't built a hypothesis and experimentally yeah. validated it or anything, yeah. but yeah. you know, I have a, I, I had a guy on my show named Colin O'Brady. Uh, you may know Colin, but in the last month or two, he came on my show and this is a guy that has several, uh, ex adventurer world records. So he mm. like was, he is the only person to do a solo unreplenished crossing of the Antarctic continent. He pulled a sled all the way across Antarctica and never resupplied. Wow. Uh, it took him 67 days. He's summited all, you know, the highest peak. Uh, there's something called the grand slam, which is the North pole, the South pole and the highest peak on all seven continents. Mm -hmm. And he did all that in like two months. I mean, it's, this guy's got some extraordinary records. So he spends a lot of time by himself, yeah. so to, you know, mm -hmm frankly, by himself under a relative amount of duress, having to get in touch with his own pain thresholds and his own endurance and his own stamina and his own inner voice telling yeah. him to quit and, mm -hmm. and so forth. So he has a book out now called The 12-Hour Walk. Mm -hmm. And it basically says, go for a damn walk for 12 hours yeah. and don't talk to anybody but yourself. Mm -hmm. And he's got all these stories of people that are like, oh, that's a, that's a novel idea. Let me go walk for 12 hours. And how it completely transforms their life. Yeah. So maybe I haven't validated it, but he validated it. It doesn't even take 24 hours, 12 hours by yourself, walking alone. You change your life, right? You just got to create some stillness. Yeah. And if you look at the world that we live in right now, if there's a decrease of anything, it's stillness. Yeah, true. So I think there's just creating some intention around getting to know yourself and letting your voice, uh, you know, reducing the the external noise enough that your voice can actually be heard. It's pretty big, man. I, I know when I had my window of time and we've, I've been on your podcast and talked about it. Like there's a window and I was like, I don't like this guy. And I think a lot of people, there's a fear around that 12 hours, mostly because you realize that when you're alone, you're not alone and you don't like who you're with. There's like that, that yeah. cause so yeah. we, we, we distract ourselves. We call our friends, we go on trips, we drink it away, watch movies but nobody just gets quiet because you, it's an actual conversation. You have to develop a relationship there. Uh, and I'm sure, so tell me, where did that come to pass for you? Because to be the person you are, the framing of the mind you have, you had to jump out of this kind of rigmarole in the, the program. What was your journey yeah. through it? So I'm going to tell you probably the greatest gift that I was ever given. And, and I'm going to, before I say it, I'm going to encourage anyone in the audience that might be so inclined to jump to conclusions about it to at least suspend judgment. Okay. I grew up around a fair amount of money. Okay. My parents were really successful. My mom was an attorney. She was a partner at a big five law firm. Mm -hmm. My dad was a money manager, uh, managed, he did wealth advisory for literally for billionaires. Like mm -hmm. he managed millions of dollars for very wealthy people. Yeah. Uh, and I was an only child. So I got to sit in this, and I was kind of isolated. Like they both worked, they didn't get home till like 6.30 at night. So I would come home at like three o'clock yeah. and I'd have like hours by myself sitting in this nice house alone, mm -hmm. reflecting on the, the prosperity, the security that I was surrounded by. 
Um, but also developing that relationship with myself. A lot of alone time as an only child with two working parents. Mm -hmm. And I think th that's part of it. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. But what I can say, you know, without doing too much uh, revisionist or retroactive, you know, self-analysis, I'll just say that for whatever reason, by the time I was a teenager, I had decoupled the idea of money and happiness. Those mm. two were not the same for me. And I think that alone gave me a different track in life. Yeah. Most people think that there's a certain financial equation that will result in happiness. Mm -hmm. And even if, and I'm not saying everybody's greedy or everybody's materialistic, I'm just saying that everybody wants the security that comes from a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a really depressed kid, man. I struggled a lot. I got bullied in school. Mm -hmm. I struggled a lot with, with like food and weight problems. I always want, I'm very envious of, of athletes like yourself. I, I mentally, I'm a great athlete mm -hmm. physically, not so much. Mm -hmm. Like I always, I love to train. I wanted to push myself, but I didn't have the body for it. I just, I don't know. I was, I was a frustrated, uh, somewhat disenfranchised kid who like had all this abundance around him. And so I just sort of grew up like, well, money ain't it. I wonder what it is. Yeah. And, and my currency in my life has always, ever since I can remember, it's been freedom, not money. And I also had parents that were astute enough to say, hey, we're not going to spoil you. And I grew up with this awareness that when I, when I turned 18, when I became an adult, I was going to be on my own. Mm. There wasn't going to be a trust fund. There wasn't going to be a, you know, a, a house that was already bought waiting for me, even though, frankly, there could have been. Yeah. And so I've just always been on this quest for freedom. And, and given that most of the world's uh, you know, what, what, what's that Thomas Jefferson quote about people, or maybe it was Ben Franklin, people who are willing to give up liberty for the illusion of security deserve neither security nor liberty. Mm. That's most of the world. And so given that I wasn't like most of the world, I just kind of had to figure it out for myself, which meant blocking out other voices. I like that, man. If it makes you feel any better, um, I have the mind, but not the body now too. So <laughs> okay. it's a little beat up now. <laughs> it doesn't do what it used to do. I throw ribs out like every month. It's hilarious. Uh, you know, I like the, the language uh, of the freedom, right? I call, I call it control. I think there's something for me, like I want to be able to be in great control of my life. Like right? mm -hmm. I can be free and still choose something that sucks. <laughs> but if I have control of my day, it's different. But I, I have this thought in my head that I like the idea of separation. I do the same with my kids. I let them know, like, you don't have anything. I have things that, that you get to use, right. like your shoes, your clothes, your bed. Uh, but I'm curious, where did the grit come from? Because here's what I battle with as a person. I have kids that are athletic, you know, and they do the thing. But there's a certain level of grit missing because they didn't grow up like crazy and poor like I did. I grew up with nothing, right, and developed this different kind of grit. I don't find most well-off people who are fluent like you were that have the kind of grit you do. Where did you develop that? Man, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know that I've distilled exactly how I do. I, I will say I try, I, I respect your instinct to hone in on that because I think that grit is the great equalizer. It's the great superpower. It's the great variable in, in outlier success stories that I, you know, I have a show and I've interviewed hundreds of really successful people and you know, some people have college degrees. Some people don't. Some people had a lot of money. Some people didn't. Some people got this. Some people don't, but everybody's got grit. Yeah. or they don't succeed, right? Mm -hmm. And so I agree with, with that, that sort of orientation. I, I think for me, I, I mean, the, the harsh answer is that grit comes from pain. Mm. That it, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Sure. Whatever we endure over time can, not always, but can transmute into grit. You know, I think that it, it, people that can find... Like, I, you know, I read a lot and, and I read books. I, not all the books I read are like in necessarily the business or entrepreneurship space. And one of the books that I come back to a lot is a book by C.S. Lewis called The Problem of Pain. Hmm. And it really talks about why would a just God allow so much pain and suffering in the world? And I don't presume to have that answer on a, you know, on a universal scale, but I can say for myself, I've suffered a lot. I suffered with bullying. I suffered with uh, sort of alienation from self as a product of a, of a genetic disorder that, that I felt very ashamed around. I've, I've, I've suffered from a weight problem. I've suffered from uh, psychological abuse in marriages. I've suffered from 
Um, a lot of scorning and shunning that came from some life choices I've made. I dropped out of high school to become a musician and, and a lot of the world that I had known sort of, I wouldn't say they turned against me, but I think they quietly rooted for my failure and I could feel that. Yeah. I've suffered a lot and the root word of, you know, the Latin word for suffering is passio, which is the root of the word passion. Mm -hmm. And I think that for some people in the right Petri dish, suffering can transmute into passion and drive and what we'll call grit. Um, or it can also, it can also break a person and it can turn into a, you know, big mushy mess of, of victimness. Mm. I think I'm fortunate that it went the former way. And, and I honestly, it, at risk of sounding self-aggrandizing, I'm a pretty tough SOB. Yeah, I know. I, I watch what you do, bro. And even to operate in the world you do, those plaques behind, for those of you who are watching, those don't come by any means more than driving into areas when people will fall away along the journey and just staying on two feet and pushing. Like, there's something that comes be behind that, and I, I have a great deal of respect for that. Uh, but you did say something. Like, you you, so you, you kind of, I don't want to say luck, but, like, you, you didn't fall apart when these things happen. Where most people, one of the things you just mentioned will shut them down for a lifetime. If we go back to when the first one took place, the first off shift moment, I don't know, like, around whatever age you want to say, let's say past bullying, maybe 18 years old, now you're entering the manhood world. What was, like, one of the first ones that you kind of faced that you overcame back then that was the catalyst to the rest of them. Yeah, so th there were a few, I would say, before 18, but okay. probably the biggest one actually happened right around 18. It, it started, I would say it was from 17 to 20. Okay. And it was, it was almost this, I look back, and it was almost sort of an out-of-body time for myself. So I dropped out of high school uh, at 16, just shy of my 17th birthday, junior year, uh, there's a whole backstory there I won't bore you with, um, but, or I won't entertain you with in okay. the interest of time. It's not, it's actually not a boring story, but, but anyway, uh, so I, I dropped out of high school and, and that was really my formal declaration to the world and to myself that I am not going to travel the, 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 the ordinary path, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to go the road less traveled and you know, that it's kind of a, there's really no coming back from dropping out of high school. I mean, yeah, you can go get your GED later and piece your life together, whatever, but it's a pretty line in the sand moment. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so my very rational idea was, okay, I got to find something to do that doesn't where essentially academic credentials play no part in one's success. Right. True. You know? And so, as a high school dropout, what are the, that's a rel, you know, essentially that, that is like anything that's like in performance. Like if I was a great athlete, you know, basically they'll change the rules. If you're a good enough athlete, mm -hmm. if you're a great singer, they'll change the rules. If you're a great dancer, they'll change the rules. Kind of like these things you can, you can get good enough at that like traditional societal rules don't apply. Yeah. And for me, the most obvious thing that I could see that I had some aptitude at was music. Okay. I had played guitar when I was younger, and I knew I had a pretty good ear, and I knew I could pick stuff up pretty fast. So I came up with this idea, and I told my parents. I said, hey, guys, listen, you know that I'm miserable in school, and you say you just want me to be happy. So I think we've established that school plus Jeff does not equal happy. Work, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to drop out. Thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. I sort of assumed the sale with my parents. Yeah. And uh, – and I said, but I think that if I get good enough at playing the piano, you won't have to worry about me. I'll be able, there's, I can go to any city on planet earth. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a pretty good piano player, I can at least get enough work to get an apartment and buy some food. Right. Mm -hmm. That was my, my thesis. And, and worse comes to worse, I can live on a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. True. Because there's always a place for a musician on a cruise ship. Yeah. Right. And so uh, they not only agreed, but they bought me a piano and they said, okay, you uh -huh. better practice. You better get to work. Okay. And uh, I spent from the age, from age 17 to age 20, I spent three years practicing piano, probably 10 or 12 hours a day. I actually taught myself out of a book called The Jazz Piano Book by Mark Levine, mm -hmm. taught myself music theory, taught myself ear training, taught myself technique. Yeah. Uh, and, and six times I auditioned at the University of Houston, Houston Music School uh, every semester, fall and spring. I would go audition and I would say, my name's Jeff Lerner. I'm a high school dropout, but I'm getting really good. Give me a chance and maybe you'll let me into college and whatever. And yeah. they would just laugh at me, right? Mm -hmm. Then the second year, they laughed a little less. Then the third year, they didn't laugh so much. And then the second semester of the third year, they were like, dang, kid, I don't, we don't know what to say, but you did it. Come yeah. on in. And they ended up letting me into the University of Houston music program. And I ended up getting a full scholarship. And I was a, 
uh, first chair piano player in the jazz orchestra. Oh. And I got 10 years of college paid for <laughs> on a music scholarship as a high school dropout yeah. who self-taught the piano in three years. And I think from that, I've just, you know, I've heard your story about, you know, you weren't the biggest kid. You weren't the fastest kid. You had to kind of, you were the little engine that could a little yeah. bit on the football field, right? Yeah. I was that in the, in the auditorium with music and yeah. you just develop a certain belief like, dang, man, I've now proven to myself that if I bear down and I don't let up, I can do some stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've been riding that ever since, I think. I like that. It actually is. That's, man, I call it dark work. It's this thing I've been, I've been kind of playing with, mm. not even playing with. It's actually the thing I've noticed is the definitive separator between success. When you shine bright is like what work you did in the dark that no one saw, wasn't sexy, was sometimes unreported. Yeah. Uh, so I love you talking to that because it does. It sets you up. You ever that one quote? I don't know who it was. He says, the first million is difficult. The next is inevitable. I don't know who said it, but I totally get it. Right? It's so true. Yeah. So that I see that. Like you're like you go through this window of time. It's like this uh, man. It like it hardens you, you know, because there's so much that nobody saw. And then so when you enter the world, you're competing for your life with conviction because you've done too much work in the dark for it not to shine in the light. Yeah. So yeah, in psychology, in psychology, there's a there's a concept called your locus of control, right? Like where is your Where's the magnet that orients your compass? Is it in you or is it outside of you? And I think that people that have gone inward to produce an outcome that is, is significant enough to be life-defining, at least in a moment, you just kind of come up with this internal orientation where like you, you, you don't really need people's permission. You don't really need people's approval. You don't really need people's sanction. You just kind of do you and you believe in it. And, yeah. and it's, it's honestly, it's the thing I wish if I could wish anything for the entire world, it would be that it would just be the, the ability to operate independently of other people's judgments or other people's accolades. Yeah. I like that. Right. <laughs> You're speaking my language. Cause I tell people all the time, making my coaching programs, I go, we got to set your scale. They go, what do you mean? I said, well, you can't borrow the world scale because the world scale is unset. Mm -hmm. and no matter what you accomplish or someone's going to go, but you didn't do this and it shuts you down. And then there's this all like I also you know another perspective of but there's gonna be problems like yeah there's inevitably gonna be problems but but I bring me to those problems so I'm good mm -hmm. like you know there's this mentality I can hear that in, in your world now I know you did well I was we're sitting here with a guy that's you know he made hundreds of millions of dollars in the online world and all that kind of stuff that doesn't connect immediately to a pianist right so how do we get to the role of what you do now what was the, what are some of the lily pad frog jumps that got you here. Yeah, well, first of all, there's, and it's funny because I interviewed a guy uh, yesterday on my show who has a name I'll pass along to you. You may know him, but his name's Lee Benson. He's a great guest if you've never had him on the show, mm -hmm. but he was a musician like me. He was a rock musician, yeah. and we were talking about the music business. Yeah, you really got to advocate for yourself as a young musician. Um, it's an industry, and it's changed a lot since I was a musician. You know, Napster was a pretty big disruptor, and now it's all fragmented and, you know, unconsolidated. But, but regardless, um, being a musician, you're at the bottom of the hill that shit rolls down, mm -hmm. right? And so you, you learn to fight if you're going to, if you're going to ever get a gig and get paid. So there was, that was part of it. But I think also, and I, this, this came clear talking to Lee yesterday, I don't think I've ever really appreciated the extent to which uh, being in a band is kind of like being an entrepreneur. It's kind of like running a business where you're trying to create this, this energy, this, this harmonious energy of a group of people. And then there's a much larger group of people that in, in music you would call the audience, in business you would call your customers, okay. that you're inviting into the energy that you as a, as a tight-knit group are creating, right? Mm -hmm. That's a small business opening its doors to customers, oh, right? Yeah. And, really cool and you learn it. about holding space and holding tension and managing energy and keeping people aligned. And musicians are pretty can be as a category fairly scattered so if you can keep a group of musicians aligned in a way that draws thousands of people in that's not that different than building a team in a business yeah. and drawing in thousands of customers so i think that was part of it too i think there's another part of it that is kind of the 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 comfort call it the being comfortable up on the tight wire mm -hmm. right where as a jazz musician I essentially had a certain set of constraints that was like maybe the tempo and the tune we were playing and the key we were in. And then I had a certain amount of, of collective, 
not constraints, but sort of collective problem solving in real time where me and the rest of the band are, are determining how are we going to express this tune in this moment? Are we going to randomly shift keys? Are we going to randomly shift into a samba? Are we randomly shift into a 6-8 time signature? Um, and then you have your individual improvisation within the moment, which is, a, you know, as a classical musician, you're meant to play it the same way every time. As a jazz musician, you're never meant to play it the same way twice, right? Mm. So I sort of am operating on three different levels as a jazz musician, right? There's this, a set of agreed upon constraints that are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. There's a different set of constraints that we're making up together as a group in real time. And then there's a third rejection of constraint, which is my improvisatory license as a solo artist or an artist within, a, within an ensemble who's, who gets to play solos. Yeah. And so like, tell me that's not a paradigm metaphor for being an entrepreneur. Yeah, dude, there's so many right? things. I, I and, so, and so the catalyst then was I'm in my mid 20s to sort of answer the, the question in terms of the plot. Mm -hmm. I'm in my mid 20s. I'm playing all these gigs. I'm, I'm super broke. Life is tough. You know, gigging musician life is tough. But, but I'm, I end up getting bo these bookings to be in the homes of these like mega, mega millionaires and billionaires, literally. So I'm playing in the home of actual billionaires. I could rattle off a half a dozen billionaires whose homes I played piano in for their little dinner parties or whatever. Yeah. And so I get this juxtaposition of like my life and their life. And I would get to the gigs early to set up. So it would literally, it would be like me and the billionaire. Mm -hmm just alone in their house. And then the caterers would start to show up and the people would start to file in. And I kind of came up with a sense of like, they're more like me or, or I'm kind of like them. The only difference is, is just the amount of money in our bank account. Like yeah. they create, they're artistic, they're innovative, but their canvas is business. My, my canvas is an instrument, yeah. but they're basically creatively expressing themselves through time as they go. They just know where they're, how their rent's getting paid at the end of the month. Yeah. And so I sort of, in my mind, I created this template of like entrepreneurship and artistry and how they're kind of two sides of the same coin. They just have a different value proposition. And that was when the seed was planted. And I said, okay, I got to get on this entrepreneurship thing because everything I wanted when I dropped out of high school, I can still have as an entrepreneur. And I could probably also raise a family and provide financial security and not be broke all the time. And just have a lot more optionality in life. And that's when I made the switch was in my mid twenties. I started trying to start businesses because I was inspired by the, by my, by my clients. I like it, man. It's a beautiful, uh, it's a, I've never heard anybody put it in those terms, man. I like your mind. It ticks properly for me. Like, I, I like Thank listening you. to you talk, man. So, so what's the first couple businesses? Like, cause obviously in order to be the place you are where you teach things now, you had to teach a lot of stuff. Was it in the teaching realm? What, what would you start off with? Oh man, I'd have to I'd have to go through my book to see where I list. I, I, a couple times in my book, I list them all. Yeah, and I identified eleven that were significant enough to write about. Eleven mm. failures, right? Yeah, starting all the way at I think sixteen was actually my first failure, but that was like a little thing. Mm. But I mean, most of them were in my mid to late twenties, and it was just one after another. Man, I just failed. I just kept. But it was like when your currency isn't money, your currency is freedom. Is it really failure? Yeah, it's a lesson. When you tried your own thing and it didn't work out, it was like, well, I was free to fail, so I still got what I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if I had been evaluating it through through the traditional worldly lens of, well, how much money did you lose, then I probably would have quit. Yeah. But that was again, that wasn't my currency. And so, you know, I I tried flipping houses. I, you know, I read Rich Dad Poor Dad and decided I'm going to become a real estate investor. Yeah. I tried that. Yeah. I tried promoting raves. I was a party promoter and I I threw a rave. Uh, I had Method Man from Wu Tang and really? uh, come come play at one of my raves. That's cool. I uh, that was that was the coolest thing that came from that whole foray was just meeting <laughs> Method Man for like five yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, to be clear, it, nothing else was cool about it. <laughs> but um, I had uh, gosh, what else did I do? I I, I tried opening a, a sandwich shop, or, or I, there was across the street from my apartment was like some old guy with a sandwich shop, and he was ready to retire. And me and a buddy convinced him to just let us basically have it and try to run it, and that failed. Uh, I, I had a bunch of different businesses. I was I was entrepreneurial, um, and and I was I, I had two things going for me. I was entrepreneurial, and I just didn't stop. Mm. And eventually, like the thing is, you only got You only got to It's like being a baseball player, man. Like you can fail. 70% of the time and still make the hall of fame. True. Very much. So I like, you know, I just, I just, I just never stopped. Cause I think that is the key to it all. And there's, there's, I love that you said that your attachment wasn't to money. 
That is something I think so few. Now, it doesn't mean you didn't need money. It doesn't mean you, you didn't need to make money and, and fund your life. I think there's a, a piece there that you might have glazed over that I want people to hear. Because for me, like, you know, I, there's a certain level of what I do that really has to be like it's a fulfillment. Like I've got to love my life. The money comes when I do that and I show up in a great way. I think that the world reciprocates and saying, hey, thanks for giving us your value. Here's some money. Uh but I love it you went through that journey. So 11 different things, and then you've got to this point like where, you know, let's say you, you finally start making the good money. What was the, what was the turning point, the ah shift moment that, that got you to the point where you got to a position financially where, like, you're doing great and you actually are helping other people do it as well? Yeah, so I, uh, 28 years old, I'm, I'm, con- I'm out. And, and the thing is, every time I start a business, I'm convinced it's the one, right? So, you have to be. Uh, so this was nothing new. This was business number 12. Well, let's say business number 11 that I was convinced was the one was these franchise restaurants. Okay. And, uh, you know, and, and it was interesting. Uh, I took on about total of about $600,000 in debt to get those off the ground. It was, it was about $300,000 each. And there were two, two locations and it was like a quick serve restaurant franchise. And this was 2007 when I applied for the loans. And in 2007, literally like if you had a pulse, you could get a loan and occasionally the pulse was optional. They were literally giving loans to dead people at that time. I'm not, I'm actually being serious, right? Wow, like crazy. That people were taking dead people's social security numbers and going and filling out loan paperwork and getting loans because the banks were too busy to even check, it check the obituaries. I mean, it was that bad. Yeah. So me, you know, 28 year old, 2007, I was a 28 year old jazz musician with a string of failures and no success to my name. And hmm. of course it makes perfect sense. A bank would loan me $600,000 to open up two restaurants, right? And uh, so anyway, that, that, but also 2007, that was the beginning of the Great Recession. Yep. The economy fell off a cliff. It's, it's not, in many ways, it's kind of similar to what we're seeing now, mm-hmm. you know, fo- followed by quantitative easing. The difference is the Fed had more they could do with interest rates at the time because interest rates weren't already so low. Uh, but whatever, we don't have to get into the economics. The point is, I was screwed. Uh, it took a year for those businesses to go under. And I was, uh, the, the net of it all was I was $495,000 in debt. Now this is 2008. I'm 29 years old. I'm 495 grand in debt. My wife at the time is, is fed up and done with me. Mm -hmm. I got evicted from my apartment. Like I had no, I I ended up, we ended up living at her parents' house, even though she was sort of estranged and, you know, leaning towards separation. It was a, it was the it was rock bottom in every sense. Right. I can feel that man. I I went through something similar with same same window. (laughs) Yeah. And well, and you ask like what, you know, what was the all shift? I mean, I'll tell you the great, the great vexation of my life is that I can't figure out how to get people to shift without them having to suffer so much. Like if I could just, cause for, I mean, it was, it was me, my story was your story. It's like hundreds of stories of people I've talked to like, Oh, I, I, I bottomed out and I finally reinvented myself to, to produce a different result. It's like, why as human beings, does it have to get so bad to unlock our potential, yeah. right? But I don't know, man. That just seems to be how we are, right? We, we don't, we really, 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 really don't like to change until it is just absolutely unbearable not to. Yeah, but we want so much. I'll, be able to talk about what they want, but they don't. Oh, change. yeah, we want different result. We just don't want to be a different person, right? Yeah, and so, so anyway, that, that's what happened is. I bottomed out and I was up in the middle of the night one night on my computer, like looking up, like how to make some money on the internet. Cause I had, I was literally hiding from creditors. They were calling, you know, I was at my in-laws house and the creditors are calling my in-laws and my in-laws let me, they let me stay there out of pity. And now they're like, oh man, we shouldn't even let him come here. Now our, now we're on the list and the creditors are calling our house. And I was like, if they ask for me, I'm not here. You know, it was a really dark time. And I started teaching myself digital marketing and I look back and I realize, you know, you see, uh, you see the thread in hindsight, you see how all the dots connect when you look yeah. back on your life. And what I realize is I had this internal confidence that, that is literally ergonomically or- organized around sitting at a keyboard. Once before in my life, I had reinvented myself after I dropped out of high school sitting at a keyboard. Yeah. Now, that was a piano keyboard. This was a computer keyboard. But for whatever reason, 
well, or for that reason, I, I had that gear of like, okay, I'm willing to sit at my computer for 14 hours a day yeah. for months and months on end, trying to get the hang of this digital marketing thing. And I did. And in 18 months, I paid off half a million dollars in debt and I really haven't looked back. That's crazy, dude. I love that, man. <laughs> it's like, it's, I'm not gonna lie, man. It's maybe one of my favorite podcast episodes in 300 something. The way that you are, are streaming and weaving these things together, they are crafted. So it's like a symphony of the way that you've, you've mm-hmm. woven in the piano. Just so you guys know, there's, it's not an accident. This man's an amazing marketer because he is me sold on like, I want to go pick up the piano to figure out the next stage of my life right now. <laughs> dude, that's awesome. So like, share with people what it is in your words that you do now. So, you know, it really, I, I'd say to understand what I do now, it really starts with exactly where we left off, right? So 2008, tail end of 2008, going into 2009, yeah. I start figuring out this digital marketing thing online. I start attending events. That was a huge part of my journey, meeting the right mentors, meeting people that they themselves had traveled the road less traveled off the beaten path. And I, and I got to just meet people that were like, oh. There actually are weirdos like me that create really great lives for themselves. I'm not just chasing this, mm-hmm. you know, ethereal thing that may or may not be out there. Like, you know, this can work. Yeah. And that, that helped me a lot to just see ordinary people that had done their version of what I was trying to do, which was essentially not conform to society's playbook mm-hmm. and, and make a great life. out. In fact, make a superior life out of it. Like these guys had amazing qualities of lives, right? They were like, they could travel, they could do what they wanted. They didn't worry about money. And Mm -hmm. as long as they had their laptop with them, they, they, they made a great income. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they had what I always wanted, which was just options, just Mm -hmm. optionality, man, freedom of choice, freedom of location, freedom of travel, freedom of exchange, freedom of value, freedom of friendship. That's, you know, those are all the things I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. How many of us are friends with people because we work with them, but if we didn't work with them, they wouldn't be our friend group, right? I mean, I just, yeah. I just never wanted to be boxed into life experience by default, if that mm. makes sense. That makes sense. And, uh, and so anyways, um, for five years, I was an affiliate marketer. That was my first foray into mo- what I call modern entrepreneurship, which is this different way of being an entrepreneur where you can essentially accelerate into leverage faster and with less money than at any previous time in history. Yeah, you could. If you look at the history of entrepreneurship, leverage comes, you know, leverage comes from scale, right? You have, there's like this economy of scale at which point a person gets leverage and it can be at, through access to capital, uh, through, you know, via lenders. It can be the leverage of having other people doing work for you. It can be the leverage of having a, a network and a high caliber brain trust and leveraging other people's thoughts and other people's minds, it's different types of leverage. Mm-hmm. But prior to internet empowered entrepreneurship, Leverage was either expensive or time-consuming to, produ- to create. The internet changed that. And the fact that in 18 months, I was able to go from like broke 11-time loser mm-hmm. to making 40, 50 grand a month, traveling around, living a pretty good life, that's the speed at which we can scale into leverage in the modern world that wasn't an option prior, right? Sure. Yeah. So that was my first experience of that was through affiliate marketing. But affiliate marketing is not the only way to get leverage with a modern, you know, sort of tech-enabled business. Yeah. So in 2012, for a variety of reasons that, again, don't really matter, I switched. I started a digital, a digital agency. Mm-hmm. And I started taking my marketing skills and selling them as a service to small and medium-sized enterprises all around the country. And uh, in six years, that agency serviced 10,000, about 11,000 small and medium-sized businesses all around the country I got a couple Inc. 5000 awards behind me from that agency. Yeah. And that was another iteration of a modern entrepreneurial venture that did really well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and then in the last two years of that, I started a sideline business that was a, a, t- a direct sales business that was driven online through software and, and a network of affiliates. And that did really well, right? So, so two, and then in 2018, I sold the agency. I had an exit. I was kind of, I was, I was 39. I was basically retired. Yeah. And at that point I had had three consecutive eight figure businesses mm-hmm. that were all powered by the internet to some degree. Yeah. Although the agency was a, a, also sort of a brick and mortar business. We had, I'm pointing upstairs because oh, yeah. the office was right upstairs from where uh-huh. I am right now. And I had about 50 people in an office, yeah. but anyways, I just sort of In 2018, I reflected on my life and what had had transpired for me in about a 10-year window. Mm -hmm. Like, man, I went from broke, nearly homeless, like Mm -hmm. not homeless only by charity, uh, depressed, 
demoralized, string of failures, twice divorced. And in 10 years, I had gone, you know, I had, I had generated tens of millions of dollars, paid off all this debt, moved across the country, remarried, had, a, had kids, had a great life. Like every, on every, I was in the best shape of my life. Yeah. In every category, my life had been completely transformed in about a 10 year period because of the power of entrepreneurship in the modern world. And I looked around at all the people around me and I live in like an upper middle class neighborhood. And so I'm surrounded by working professionals who whether or not they have more money than me, they do not have nearly the, the quality of life that I do. They do not own their time. They do not love their jobs. They do not walk around whistling all the time because they're so happy they don't know what to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, if the broke jazz musician can have this life and all the people that did the right things and went to the right schools and got the right jobs and checked the right boxes, they're not as happy as I am. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm on to something. Yeah. So I started putting out videos in 2018, just kind of telling people how I had done what I had done. And fast forward to now, event, you know, people started sharing the videos and asking questions. And I realized there was a market for this information. And four years later, a little over four years later now, we have, uh, you know, one of, if not the largest entrepreneurial education platforms in the world. We've enrolled almost 275,000 students. Uh, it's a nine figure business. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I pinch myself every day that not only that, I'm having this great, you know, success experience, but more than anything that I get to be this fulfilled doing this much good in the world. That's actually what I pinch myself about. Yeah. I love that, man. I, I hopped on somebody's live stream at one point and they were like, you know, hey, if you can make a million dollars, you only make $50,000. Is there a problem with that? And I go, and he was asking a biblical question. I go, I think it is. He goes, well, why? I go, at the end of the day, if you have the ability to give something of value to the world, right, that the world will say, hey, because of your value given here is money and you don't do that, you're robbing the world of the gift of you. So when I hear nine figures, I, I, I get it. Most people go, oh, that's a lot of money. And, you know, but, but you know how much value you have to provide to the world to reach that? And that only comes from experience and then caring. Like you give a damn, right? And when you do that, the world says, thank you, here is my money. And then everybody's happy. And so those of you guys listen and realize that that's, that's that man serving at a super high level. And I appreciate you. So I do know you have written this book that you sent to me. I have two of these copies, actually. Thank you. Uh, called Unlock Your Potential. And it sounds like this is all in the same vein. Would I be correct in stating and assuming that? Yeah. So I have a really, I mean, first of all, yes, you're, you're correct. Um, where the book ends and my, my education platform begins and even where I end and my education platform begins is a pretty, is pretty nebulous, right? Like it's all just a continuum of this, you know, what, what I've tried to create are frameworks mm -hmm. that are installable into virtually any human life to help people level up their and, and unlock their potential, right? Yeah. Now, I happen to believe that entrepreneurship is, you know, there's a lot of different modalities for personal development. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go to seminars, you can go to church, you can, you know, get a therapist, yeah. you, can, you can get in the right relationship, you can marry the right woman. Like there's a lot of different things that'll challenge you and grow you and develop you. Sure. But entrepreneurship is the only one that can also make you rich. That's true, man. It's a different monster, man. You know, it, it's yeah. the it's the ultimate forge for personal growth because you you don't just make a new life with it. You can also make a living with it and a damn good one, right? Yeah. That's why I think entrepreneurship is so powerful. It's not because the world is crying out for some, you know, someone to start another business. There's already 31 million businesses just in the United States. We don't need another business. Mm -hmm. But dang, we need another entrepreneur. A civilization that is built on entrepreneurial values and entrepreneurial behaviors is a dramatically different world yeah. than the one we currently inhabit and love to complain about. I agree, man. It's the and, and unlock your potential is not so much about here's why you should start a business. It's more here's how to unlock your inner entrepreneur that will do everything a different way. And so these frameworks, they're not just business frameworks. They're not just professional frameworks. Um, we, we actually have a, a kind of a core tenet called the three P's, which is physical, personal, and professional growth. And there's an entrepreneurial way to be in all those areas of life. And the whole point of those, of those three P's is actually, we talked earlier about stillness. When you have a disciplined physical life and a disciplined and thoughtful personal life and a disciplined and abundant professional life, you create enough stillness and confidence and stability in your life that in the clearing, the fourth P can emerge, which is your purpose. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people get it backwards. They think, man, if I could just figure out why I'm here, if I could just figure out my, my created imperative, then I would live this actualized life and I would wake up so excited every day. No, 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 no. Start putting in the reps now. Mm-hmm. Start training as if you know what the battle will be. Yeah. And then when the battle presents itself, you'll be trained. And by the way, the battle will present itself to the person who's been training. Yeah. And when you get clear then on your purpose, now you're that much more reason, you have that much more reason to double down on the three Ps mm-hmm. and push your training even further. And it becomes this loop where like, I'm clear in my purpose, so day to day I live through my training and I'm inspired in my training because I'm clear in my purpose. Yeah. And, and, then, and then all you wanna do is live longer because life is so damn fun. I dig it, man. It's a enjoyable whole circle there. You ever heard the Deion Sanders video about him talking about practice and then preparation and games? No, but I love it already. Um, Please send it to me. I got to find that I'm going to send it to you because I want to say he talks about all these kids, man. They just go to practice to practice. He goes, I went to every practice with a purpose. I wanted to get better for the game. I wanted to show up in the game and dial in. He says, so there was, but whenever you're practicing for a purpose, there's a purpose for your practice. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's basically what I'm saying. It's just, yeah. How do you apply that off the field in all areas of your life? I agree, man. I dig it, dude. I've, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Like I, I'm not gonna lie, man. You, you got a, you got a way with words in the greatest of ways, dude. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Thank if you, somebody man. wants to come grab this book or, or find out more about you and your school and stuff, where would I send them? Um, yeah, I mean, for the book, our friend, uh, our friend Bezos created mm-hmm. a, a, a platform where people can buy books, <laughs> uh, and it's on Amazon there. Yeah and uh, unlock your potential. You know, if people want to come find out more about me, I'd say, what's your attention span? If, you're, if your attention span, if you can handle content that lasts longer than a minute, mm-hmm. please come find me on YouTube. Yeah. I have about 900 free training videos on YouTube where you'll get all the Jeff you could possibly want. And if you like what I'm, and it's free, it's YouTube. Yeah. And if you like what I'm about, maybe you'll want to go further and, and you know, make a, make a formal relationship in my education platform. Uh, if you have a short attention span and you know that about yourself, then just go to Instagram and it's kind of the same. It's just all smaller bites. Gotcha. Um, I like it. I like and it. I'm Jeff Lerner official on both platforms. Beautiful. Uh, I will make sure you have those in those notes, everybody. So you can go ahead there. Final question. You ready for it? I'm ready. Here I'm ready. Go, man. What promise did God make to the world when he created you? <sighs> there will only be one of these. <laughs> It, it, that, that, that's that, that, you know what? I feel like I, I feel like I took a, an easy, an easy out on that. Um, when God gave me to the world, I think what he said is this will be a case study in someone who transmutes hardship into service. Mm. And bear in mind, I'm saying that not as an absolute descriptor of self, because that would be arrogant. I'm stating that as a standard that I strive for every day. I like that, man. I like it. You've, you've definitely lived from what you're saying. You've lived that uh, in abundance in ways that I'm sure we haven't even unpacked yet. So, oh, man, I hey, appreciate you. Thank you so much, seriously, for spending some time with us. Make sure you guys who are tuned in now, you go and find this man. Uh, if something he said sparked an idea, follow that down the rabbit hole to find out what it can do to change your life. If you also know someone in your world that needs to listen to this podcast because they've been floating around, they're on the fence, they won't listen to you, let them listen to Jeff. So share this episode with them. Outside of that, as always, make the most of your awe shift moments. You can make shift happen. It's Anthony Trucks and Jeff Lerner signing off. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Awe Shift podcast. I pray that we gave something amazing to your life. And if you found this episode served you in some way, I would love you could share it with people you know, people you love, as well as your community, because you never know who needs that simple little seed that can grow into something amazing for their life. And the actual training doesn't stop here. If you want your free copy of the show notes sent to you after every episode so you can get the major points consolidated down, simply go to textanthony.com and message the word notes. Till next time, make shift happen.